Okay, so uh, I'm Eduardo. I'm going to present uh, the, the paper we submitted, Data-Dependent Confidentiality in uh, Dynamic Condition Response Graphs. This is part of a larger project, which is TARDIS. Okay, so when modeling um, business processes, there are multiple approaches. Uh, there are declarative and imperative approaches. Uh, most of them support some kind of uh, security property, uh, security functionality, such as uh, access control and uh, executor role, so basically who can execute what. But uh, most lack uh, mechanisms to ensure data confidentiality. Okay, so we will focus explicitly on dynamic condition response graphs, which are a uh, declarative event-based approach to business processes. Uh, here we have uh, the example of a uh, DCR graph, which uh, models um, the medical, uh, no, no, a medical appointment process. There are four events, uh, write report, prescribe medicine, emit invoice, and uh, the payment event. Uh, there are some restrictions between these events. Uh, for instance, um, the first event to execute must be the right report and must be executed by the uh, doctor. By specifying who can execu execute what, we are already specifying the executor roles, which are there in the left bottom corner. Uh, the, uh, um, so the second um, restriction is that a doctor may prescribe uh, medicine, so this event is entirely optional. Uh, a clerk must emit an invoice, and after the, the invoice, the, the, the customer, the patient, must, must pay for the appointment. Uh, the last um, constraint is that uh, every event can only occur once. Just a quick note, in, the, left, in the, the upper left corner, there is some marking which defines the initial state of an event, uh, which initially excludes or, may, or uh, um, makes an execution mandatory. We will uh, see that in the following slides. Okay, uh, this is part of a larger process, which also allows to um, manage patients and doctors, besides making an appointment. However, we will focus on uh, the smaller subgraph, subprocess, as it is um, easier for uh, presentation effects. And we will just use this, uh, the entire process uh, in specific moments. Okay, so dynamic condition responses, as uh, uh, response graphs, as I previously stated, are uh, declarative event-based approaches to process businesses. As such, they, they are uh, quite flexible when it comes uh, to program acceptance and uh, changing a program or programs, since we only have to, to reason about uh, pairwise events, if, uh, pairs of events. This, uh, this, this also makes it uh, quite user-friendly. Okay, so the events, one of the, main comp one of the two main components of the DCR graphs, are nodes and are stateful entities. As such, they comprise the, sti the state of the graph. Um, it is possible to execute events, changing their uh, state and therefore the state of the graph. <clears throat> events fall into two categories in DCR graphs. They are either input or computation events. If they are input events, they allow for input, uh, the, uh, the input of external information. And in the case of computation values, they allow to either store or generate new values based on existing ones. Okay, um, as stateful entities, events store both data and <coughs> metadata. In the metadata, we have control information, such as whether or not uh, an event has already executed, if it is pending, and if it is included. An event is pending if its execution is mandatory for the graph, uh, to, for the process to, stabili to stabilize, to, re to reach an acceptable state. And... Um, the uh, node uh, may, may or may not be included since DCR graphs allow for the dynamic inclusion and exclusion of events. Um, regarding data, um, the only data they store is, the, is their value. Uh, and it does not make sense to have a value if the, the event in, is not, has not executed. In that case, the, the data, the value is undefined. There is also... Uh, bit of a hidden uh, information, which is the enableness, uh, which is if we can or cannot execute an event, but that is calculated dynamically based not only on the, on the included uh, set, but also on the constraints, on the relations. <clears throat> 
Okay, so at the graph level, uh, we store the state of all events in the, in the marking, which is the tuple between three set, uh, consisting of three sets and a uh, function. The three sets map directly to, to the booleans, so uh, it's a set of ex um, executed events, a set of include, uh, pending events, a set of included events, and the final uh, element of the tuple is a partial function map mapping uh, events to values. <coughs> Here, uh, sorry, here, the three events on the right side are grayed out since they are excluded and cannot be ex uh, executed. They are initially ex excluded due to the percentage mark on the, initial, on the left upper corner, and the, um, the, the right event report is in the included set, um, pending set of events since it has the bank which uh, st states that uh, the initial state of the, uh, of the, the event is pending. Okay, so regarding relations, uh, the relations are the, no, the um, edges of the graph, and there are six types of relations in uh, dynamic condition response graphs. So the first two, uh, exclusion and inclusion relations, allow for the dynamic inclusion and exclusion of nodes in the graph. Um, note that the inclusion and exclusion it, uh, is, does not uh, immediately refer to, okay, the nodes do not exist. It just means that we do not take those nodes into account when evaluating constraints. Okay, so the, the exclusion uh, relation establishes that if the event on the left-hand side of the relation executes, then the event on the right side of the relation must be excluded from the graph. This, of course, uh, assuming that G, which is the relation guard, the guard evaluates to true. Uh, the inclusion relation has the opposite effect. If uh, the, the event on the left-hand side executes, then the event on the right-hand side of the, um, of the relation must uh, be included. Okay, so now considering the, the, the example, if, uh, if we execute the right report, uh, yeah, right report, uh, we have to first include uh, the right report into the set of executed events, we exclude it from the set of pending events since it has executed, uh, since it was put in the set, and we remove it from the set of included events. This is due to the, the um, exclusion relation with itself, but on the other hand, we include the other three events due to the green arrows, the inclusion relation. Note that uh, although P has now been uh, included, it still cannot execute. This is due to the remaining relations, which we uh, will see in the next slide. Uh, another detail is that um, the event uh, emit invoice is also pending, once more due to one of the due to one of the relations, which is the response relation. Okay, uh, the next two relations: the condition relation and the re uh, response relation. The, the condition relation establishes that an event can, uh, on the right hand side cannot execute unless the event on the left hand side has either executed or is not in the graph, is excluded, and of course the, the guard evaluates the true. The response relation, on the other hand, states that if the event on the left-hand side executes and the guard evaluates the true, then the event on the right-hand side must mandatorily execute before the graph can reach a stable state. Therefore, event E becomes pending. So now, uh, if we execute the event emit invoice, we shush. Okay, uh, so if we execute emit invoice, we add it to the set of executed events, we remove it from the pending events, and remove it from the included events. The removal from included events is once again due to an exclusion relation with itself, but uh, we now add pay events to the set of pending events due to the response relation, the blue arrow, and now we can pay, uh, we can execute the pay event due uh, since the condition relation, the yellow arrow, has its constraints fulfilled. Uh, emit invoice has executed, therefore pay can execute. Okay, uh, the last two relations are the milestone relation, uh, which is similar to the condition relation, but allows to repeat the wait for, a, for an event to execute. While in the condition relation, if the, if the event on the left hand, hand side executes, it stays executed, we cannot un-execute it. 
um, if it is executed, all events uh, that are related to it through a condition uh, if a relation can, ex can execute. The milestone, by requiring that the event is not pending, allows to repeat the waiting. So if uh, there is an event pending and we execute it, it is no longer pending, but we can uh, later, uh, at a later time, re-add it to the set of pending events by using a uh, response relation. Okay, uh, finally, the spawn relation allows to instantiate subprocesses and nodes. So this uh, is actually addition of new nodes and graphs and subgraphs to the graph itself. So, for instance, if we execute the, the event new patient, we get a new patient. If we execute it one more time, we get another patient. Note that, uh, take note that the identifiers are different. We have P1 and P2. This is due to alpha renaming when performing the spawn relation to, uh, uh, to avoid naming conflicts. Okay, so now we can also execute the new doctor. In that case, we got a new doctor and a new new appointment event. And if we execute the new appointment event, we get the whole subgraph, the subprocess that we were uh, using as an example. Okay, uh, so um, basically our objective is that given some sort of API that users use, use to communicate with the graph, uh, for instance, a REST API, um, we can uh, compartmentalize information and, there, uh, and therefore uh, stop uh, users with insufficient privilege from accessing secret information. For instance, an admin can access anything, but a clerk can only access billing information. For instance, a doctor has, has access to the report and the prescription, but not to billing information. Uh, a patient has access to everything, but unrelated patients and doctors, also meaning that this is not the, the, the appointment's doctor nor the appointment's patient, cannot access anything. Okay, so to accomplish this goal, we resort to dynamic uh, value-dependent information flow control. So we basically label events and then monitor data accesses and event uh, execution. So, uh, information flow control relies on a security lattice, which is a um, uh, partially ordered lower bound, a lower bounded finite set of security classes together with a least upper bound operator, and uh, consists in tagging data and then tracking data throughout the system and painting the, the, the values resulting from computations involving that, uh, that information. Then we just have to stop um, uh, illegal, what we deem as illegal uh, information flows, information leaks. Okay, so this is the, the lattice we use. It's a value dependent lattice, which means that the labels are parameterized with, with runtime values. Uh, this uh, allows for richer information flow policies that, as it allows for um, individual security compartments. For instance, if we use a, a regular, a non-parameterized label such as clerk, every clerk shares the same security compartment and therefore every clerk can access every clerk's information. So if we use the single label uh, patient, a patient could access other patients' data and we do not want that. So therefore we use um, value-dependent information uh, flows. Okay, one small detail is that the information flow labels here match the, the access control roles, the, the executor roles, uh, but this is just a small detail. Uh, it is not mandatory, it is not always the case. It, we just did it like this because it made, ex made sense in the context of our example. Okay, the, the lattice we use still has a few, uh, one small problem, which is, well, it is so good at compartmentalizing information that now we cannot share information between a uh, doctor and the patient, for instance. We could, but we have to, to define those security labels, and that would be a bit bothersome. So we use a power set lattice, which, is allow, which allows to use as security labels uh, sets of the of labels of the security lattice. The, it respects the original flow, so we get what we want. We can now share, uh, create a security compartment that allows to share information between a specific patient and a specific doctor, for instance. Okay. Okay. Now that we uh, have labels and can monitor the events. Uh, all we have to do, uh, all we have to do now, is monitor the, inter the communication interface, and whenever 
an unauthorized entity, or, or that is, an, an entity with insufficient security clearance tries to access security data, we just have to stop it. OK, at first glance, this might seem OK, but there is a small problem. Um, this handles explicit information flows, which are, which are information flows that result from direct operations, such as assignments, in this case, read operations. We still need to address uh, implicit information flow leaks, which arise from the control uh, structure of, in this case, a process. OK, uh, basically, there are, uh, we have identified two types of impl implicit information leaks. Well, they are all in, 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 uh, implicit information leaks. We just made that distinction because one is trickier than the other. It's not so uh, explicit, although they are implicit. <laughs> OK, uh, so the first one, the first type of information leaks uh, implicit information leaks results from changes in the marking of an event. So if we have two events, one secret event in, uh, which is initially included and a second event public which is excluded and if they are connected, uh, related through um, an inclusion relation, as is the case, if we execute uh, the, the secret event, we enable, uh, the, we in include and enable the, the, the public event. So what we have here is that at this point, a, a user, uh, an entity that could watch, could uh, access public events was not able to see anything. There's nothing there. And after the execution of event one, it can see there, that there is a new event, a public event that is now available. So it can, uh, the, that entity that uh, can infer that there is some secret event and that that event was uh, indeed uh, executed. So we cannot have uh, secret uh, events changing the marking of public events. Okay, another, uh, the other type of implicit leak, which is a bit uh, trickier, is when a secret event uh, enables or disables a public event. This does not necessarily mean that there is a change in the marking. For instance, we have those two secret events, event one and event two, related through uh, an inclusion relation, and uh, with event two initially excluded, and event two has a condition relation with event three. So the condition, uh, to, to just to remind, the condition relation defines that the event on the right hand side, to, uh, for the event on the right, uh, the right hand side to execute, the event on the left hand side must either be excluded or have executed. In this case, it is excluded. However, if we execute event one, event two becomes included, and therefore uh, it is taken in, it, 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 it is taken into account when uh, evaluating constraints. Therefore, even three becomes excluded since E2 is, is uh, even two is included and has not <coughs> executed. So in this case, one, uh, we have once more that a entity capable of uh, of um, observing uh, secret uh, public events at one at one point it sees one secret uh, one public event and then uh, after something that he doesn't know but he can make some assumptions okay there is an event that executed he uh, stops seeing it so we also cannot uh, allow for um, secret events to to enable uh, public events okay so this here takes us to one uh, the first of our results which is the the, inform the dynamic information flow monitor just uh, to be quick here uh, delta prime which is the appears first is the security label of access data in uh, e and delta is the security label of g of the guard it, it is, it's necessary to take them into account. PC, the PCE is the PC, uh, is the label of uh, security uh, is the label the security label of event E. Okay, um, so basically our monitor defines that one in the, the first condition there that delta prime uh, less or equal than PCE is that an event cannot access data above its security level. It makes sense. A public event cannot access secret data. Uh, a secret event cannot change the marking of a public event. And a secret event cannot indirectly enable or disable public events. So we have both, uh, all, uh, have, uh, both explicit and implicit flows uh, covered. 
The second result is the, our formulation of non-interference for uh, DCR graphs. So basically, it's a uh, typical uh, non-interference. So uh, two graphs, uh, given, uh, given two graphs, uh, initially indistinguishable. If we execute uh, two sequences of events, which agree on the low events, meaning that the, the public events must happen in the same sequence and must be the same, uh, our monitor ensures that by the end of the execution, when the graph reaches a stable state, um, the graphs will be remain indistinguishable, so there will not be information leaks. We actually enforce uh, the... the um, the, our monitor actually infor, uh, enforces uh, termination sensitive non interference since it does not pre stop the execution of nothing. Uh, it does not uh, halt the execution. It just does not allow the, exe uh, the execution of certain events. So they remain hidden, which is not problematic. Okay. Uh, regard, uh, so regarding related work, there's something really, uh, there is some work uh, regarding. Um, uh, information flow control and, well, more generally, uh, data privacy in uh, uh, business processes. Agostin, Agostin Elliott Toll analyzed privacy constraints in GDPR uh, and proposed design patterns to integrate them in business processes. This, however, is just a design pattern and does not enforce anything. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, Toots et al. develop a tool to analyze the extent of information leakage in uh, process output. However, once more, it analyzes to what extent information was leaked and does not prevent it. Uh, uh, pull on and et al. Um, extend BPMN, which is an, uh, uh, an imperative approach to, be, uh, to business processes with information flow uh, capabilities. Uh, Barani et Rana, uh, and Rana employ a smart, con employ smart contracts to verify GDPR compliance in business processes. And Accorsi and Lemon uh, develop a tool to enforce uh, non-interference and petri nets. Okay, uh, to conclude, uh, we, present an, we have presented an extension to DCR graphs, which, allow, which allows for um, value-dependent dynamic information flow control, and also uh, formalization for non-interference for DCR graphs. Uh, as, uh, as for future work, uh, we have multiple possibilities. For instance, applying this model to Rigrada, which is another uh, prev previous work. Um, resort to either static or hybrid analysis, which we also have some works related to it. And uh, enhance uh, access control capabilities, namely uh, stronger guarantees regarding uh, integrity. Okay, that's all. Any questions? Okay, I, I feel that missed the plot somewhere. Could you roll back to your transformation rules? Transformation? Yeah, you have A okay, arrow, yeah. A prime. Yeah, uh, okay. here basically... No, no, not this one. Further back. Further back. back. Further back, further back. Go. Roll. I need to go, you need to go to 15 or something, somewhere there. Okay, easier this where, way. Where you define them. Yeah, further, this one. Okay. So, for example, so, so in this context, E is a node in a graph. Yeah, okay. it's an event. And you say the node transforms into another node. No, 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 no. That's what this rule says. No. It changes the marking of the other node. It changes, uh, does not transform it to another node. Okay, because th there is no relation, so E is a node in a graph. Yeah. So, I would expect this rule to be apply to a graph in which E occurs and then in that graph you find E prime and that one is excluded. Is that correct? Well, uh, the Because relation, E prime is free in this thing. This the is relation here is it's just one of the constraints of the graph. So it's part of the graph and when evaluating the enabledness of an event we have to take into account this constraint which is... Yeah, but, so, but the E prime is another node in the graph. Yeah. Okay. Can can there be more than one E prime? No. Uh, 
Basically, it's this one. So we it's, 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 it's the context. I mean, I appreciate that you give an abbreviation of the definition. I, I see that. But the rule itself is unclear to me. So are you saying that, you know, any E prime can be blocked? Well, as long as it's in an exclusion relation with E, any event can also can be excluded. And this is a connected graph? Everything yeah. is connected? Yeah. Because the example you gave was not connected? It is, uh, yeah, it's not a connected graph, but uh, it affects all connected nodes. So, so the interpretation of that rule is that you recursively search to the graph for E prime? Uh, sorry, uh, just give me a second. So um, for uh, spawn relation, it's later. For instance, uh, here, uh, if, for instance, imagine that there was an exclusion relation between patient two and uh, disappointment. If we executed uh, patient this this P uh, two, the only excluded relation would be this one, which is where uh, to which P two would be connected. So there is already a connection between those two yes. nodes in the graph, yeah. and it is through the exclusion rule. And if the first node gets executed, then you automatically yes. change the output. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. When we define the process, we have the, to both define the nodes and the, the relations. Okay. So it is not that the, the rule is a transformation of the graph, it's in the graph already? Yeah. Okay, okay thank you. If your goal is to model like real world business scenario, I'm not sure that those must relationship mm, are real world friendly. Like the customer must pay. Uh, what what happens if the customer do not pay? That your tool desynchronize with the reality that is. No, uh, that is just to convey the cons the, the, re the the relation, but. The in yeah, but while I mean, in, I don't think there is anything in the domain of business thing that actually must happen. Like well, here we only accept a graph. An, a graph is only in the in an acceptable state if there are no pending events. So by using the must, we we convey that either with the bank mark or with the response relation, and that puts an event in the response uh, in the pending set of events. While that set is not empty, the the graph we cannot say the graph is in a stable state, uh, is not is not in an acceptable state. So it has to happen eventually at some time, maybe here, maybe maybe now, maybe 50 years in the future, it has to happen. Maybe I, I can I can add something to that. So it's the event becomes pending response. That means the, the process is not finished, cannot finish. If it's distant from the reality, it's because it, it was badly modeled. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to, so the system that you program doesn't cover that case, but you can cover another event that is someone saying, okay, give up on paying and that excludes some pending event disappears and then the graph is stable. No. It's about modeling. It's not. It's yeah, but that's kind of what I said. Like the yeah. mass relation is always an error when you're modeling. Well, reality. but it's pending. It, it, the the the, oh. the event becomes pending response. So it's pending on systems and real systems have events that well need someone to take care of those. Yes. So that is part of business processes. Yeah. You have to cover for those cases as well, yes, in your I, modeling. I can still imagine some scenarios where you do have a must that... Oh, sorry. Uh, I can still imagine some scenarios where you do have a must, like if you must pass like a credit check before a bank will give you a loan mm -hmm. or something. Um, it, it might not be common, but I, I think there are some scenarios there. I just had a, a, a small question. <laughs> okay, because they already asked a lot. Of, so um, it's somehow related. So I was uh, missing, in some sense, like the connection of these uh, new relations 
with so how natural are these as are these so why did you uh, uh, study d why, uh, uh, why this set of six relations yeah uh, why you got, you got interested I, I understand that this is part of a, of a project okay <laughs> but, um, but these but relations are part of the of the dynamic condition response graphs which are not uh, exactly my work okay i've now i've just extended them with uh, information ah okay okay so the idea is that is that you have a former work yeah, and the idea is that you are going to. So you, okay, okay. So that was yep. missing in the whole thing. Okay, so in the whole okay. picture. So you had a former work, maybe this da grana or, or basically the, the uh, grana, and the idea is, is to extend it to uh, be able to handle this DCR uh, thing. to okay, okay. Uh, to uh, okay. So that's the reason of this yep. relation. So they come from this other thing. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Okay, uh, and also uh, I. I the other question that I had is that, uh, well, I, 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 I have worked on non-interference mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and the other one, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I understand, the, uh, well, I would like to, un to, to believe, or I would like to understand that these relations are indeed necessary for you to do the non-interference thing. Sorry, these relations Yeah, are? so these new relations are indeed necessary for you to be able to reason about non-interference, about the, the, uh, the... Is that the case? Uh, sorry, I'm yeah. not understanding the question. So, the uh, new relations? No, no, can you go to the, to the very end of the... Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, in the, in the information flow, one, one more. Yeah. Non-interference. Mm -hmm. So I am understanding that these new relations you are adding, you are studying here, okay, are indeed necessary for you to, to, to do the non-interference. Well, the thing is, I do not actually introduce any new relation. The six relations that we talked about, so the inclusion-exclusion condition, uh, response, uh, milestone, and uh, spawn are already existing. I do. N I did not add anything regarding the relations. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. Well, it's not so relevant. <laughs> I will come to it later. But, but that that uh, you are interested in doing non-interference with those six uh, yeah. relations. That's the point. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not that 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 like two different uh, works that it happened to uh, go together. Okay, so you weren't interested from the beginning in doing non-interference so, yeah. with those six relations. I have this. Uh, language, the DCRs, then I want to uh, uh, be sure that there are no information leaks in the graphs. Okay, and, 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 and a very last thing, I, I got, so I understand it, but I, I got confused about the E and E prime. Um, the thing is, those are two different lists of events. Yes, uh, uh, so basically the sequence of events just have to agree on the public events. Ah, okay, 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 but then I was expecting some extra Okay. symbol okay. there, okay. like okay. E and E prime are equal some other uh, yeah. uh, like uh, that's why they have equivalent relation. both have L uh, event, pu yeah. low, uh, uh, public events, and then they have each his own set, uh, their own sequences of uh, secret events. Well, well, L and H are, uh, there will be like the assignment, like the original assignments for low uh, actions and high actions? Yes, basically. Or something like that. Okay. Okay. No more questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thank you.